Okay, good. Yes? No? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I went, as a way to get ready to talk, I went to see a little pilgrimage to Hegel's grave this morning, and um, I communed with him, and I, I, but unfortunately, I, then I realized that he was a terrible lecturer, and that I might have, some of his bad lecturing might have got to me, so I hope that if, I hope that I'm clear, and if I stop and spend a lot of time thinking, and then come up, and then, sp that'll be because I've gotten Hegel into me. Um, so I want to thank Ben, where's Ben? Ben, thanks uh, for inviting me. I wanted to say also, do you know this line from Blue Velvet, here's to Ben? I always wanted to say that, and I, I want to say it now, so here's to Ben. Because uh, most Frank Booth lines are not publicly quotable, but that one, I think, is. Okay, uh, so the central tenet of liberal, sorry, uh, the liberal conception of freedom is that individuals must be left alone to pursue their own interests. So what I'm going to say in the beginning is, I think self-evident, but I'm leading to something. Um, this form of freedom is consonant with capitalist society in which individual interest, self-interest, trumps concerns about the collective. From Jean-Jacques Rousseau to John Stuart Mill to even Milton Friedman, defenders of liberal freedom insist on this idea as a bedrock of a free society. So liberal freedom, that is equivalent to free society. And Mill puts this in On Liberty pretty nicely, I think. He says, the only liberty which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive it of others or impede their efforts to obtain it. Each is the proper guardian of his own health, whether bodily or mental and spiritual. So that's a nice, you know, a nice, what's not correct, okay. Uh, okay, but I'll probably move around and then it'll be wrong again, okay. Uh, Okay, so so this so in in, in in this view, I think um, freedom is inextricable from the pursuit of one's good, and I think that's something that most of us, most liberals, probably agree on. The liberal conception of freedom thus emphasizes the free will, a conscious will which is free to decide the path that the individual takes without external constraint. But this liberal conception of freedom never. I don't think stops to consider where my conception of my good or my interest comes from. It assumes the identity of my good with my subjectivity. I just naturally produce it as if the good is some immediate product of me as a subject. But as long as the subject pursues its own good, I want to claim it accepts a self-definition that comes from a social authority. My good, in other words, my good is never initially my own, but always that of another, a big other. Uh, and this social authority, this big other, determines where I direct my freedom, which is why the liberal conception of freedom is always directed toward betterment in some way, usually social betterment, but at least individual betterment within the society. The assumption of liberalism is that subjects find satisfaction by advancing themselves within society. Uh, and according to this logic, the more status that one has, the more satisfaction one has. So, so this idea that if I gain recognition, that gives me more satisfaction. The more I gain, the more I get. Uh, whether recognition comes through money, fame, romance, whatever. Uh, the liberal freedom, this liberal freedom manifests itself in social triumphs, such as earning, I just said this, a great deal of money, finding an attractive spouse, uh, getting a good job, etc. Liberal freedom leads to the avoidance of overcome, or the overcoming of failure through the pursuit of one's self-interest. And I think this is the key that it's the overcoming of failure, but at the same time, it's the freedom to fail. So because I'm aiming at success at any time, I could also fail, right? That's just part of that's included in it. So, uh, so this idea that, that, that failure would be a point at which the subject didn't realize itself, but at least it had the capacity to realize it held itself through striving for success. But here, and this is my, the claim I want to develop in the paper, um, but once successes, I don't think, are the source of satisfaction within the psychic libidinal economy. In this sense, I think psychic economy runs exactly contrary to capitalist economy, just as it runs contrary to the liberal conception of freedom. The liberal economy runs on the subject's, sorry, sorry not the liberal, the libidinal economy runs on the subject's failures, not its successes, and these failures are paradoxically also the sites of the subject's freedom. So that's a key thing that I want to say is that failure is tied directly to freedom. 
We are, free, we are only free at the moments when our unconscious acts, I think, subvert our conscious will. So I am free when I am only free when I choose against my interests, when I pursue a direction that defies my good. In other words, freedom exists as the antipode of the literal conception of freedom. So I want to, I'm trying to say that there's what genuine freedom is is the exact opposite of what the liberal idea of it is. This is because my own good is always the product, as I said, of some a kind of external force that erects it as an illusion that then guides my conscious actions, but that, I, but that always fades whenever I get too close to it. So my good is a nice illusory thing. The more I get closer to my good, the more it ceases to, the, it, it escapes from me and ceases to be my good. Um, so I, I, if I, for instance, if I identify obtaining my good with uh, getting a million dollar salary, it's clear, first of all, that this image of my good is not my own. I've gotten it from somebody else. Uh, it comes from capital society. I've merely taken over the idea of this good. Uh, and in this sense, in, in cons, there's a problem again. No, 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 OK. Uh, there is a problem. No, it's, so I, I keep moving. That's the problem. Um, so it's going to, you'll have to, <laughs> maybe we can do a constant kind of uh, dance. Okay, uh, so anyway, so, so my good, whatever it is, is never really my own good. But I think in a certain way, this is only the beginning of the problem with the good. When I finally obtain what I've identified with it, I don't find the happiness or the satisfaction I expect. Instead, I find happiness just around the corner. Uh, if you've ever seen the show Mad Men, Don Draper gives a great example of this when he's on a sales pitch. He says, happiness is always the thing that's just the next thing that I'm going to get. And, I, and he thinks that, and it's actually true, he does close the sale, but he's like, this, he thinks that's a good way to sell something. Uh, and he thinks that's the best way to advertise, which maybe he's right. Uh, so whatever our image I construct of my own good will always suffer from this deficit. The attempt to realize it will expose it as an illusion. So without the good as a genuine possibility, I think the liberal conception of freedom actually falls apart. The absence of the good as a motivation gives the subject, uh, gives the subject nothing to pursue. The liberal subject is thus cast adrift without any mooring. And uh, Mill marks this dependence explicitly and on liberty. But I think every liberal thinker has to rely on this idea of the good in order to have liberal freedom. If you don't have the one, you, I don't think you have the other. So once we strip the good away, our conception of freedom must be, look beyond the liberal horizon. And I think actually it's Immanuel Kant who was the first to genuinely break with the liberal conception of freedom, even though I think some people maybe think of him as a liberal thinker. I absolutely do not. So for Kant, uh, freedom does not consist in advancing one's own interest or procuring one's own good but precisely in the opposite direction. I think this is his great advance. That one attests to freedom, the actuality of freedom, only through the act of suspending one's own good in order to follow the moral law, right? So everyone, this is kind of ABC of Kant. Uh, the law's fundamental restriction of interest plays a necessary role, Kant believes, in the constitution of freedom. Without self-limitation through giving oneself the moral law, the subject would never emerge as free. As Kant sees it, there's no freedom without a radical self-restriction. So Kant, Kant complicates this straightforward liberal conception of freedom by introducing this detour of the law's restriction. He understands that my own self-interest is actually something foreign to me, as I just tried to explain, uh, the result of an imposition by an external logic that prioritizes it for me. The, so the law, in contrast, asserts my freedom by stripping away the priority of this intruder and thereby enabling me to grant priority to the moral law that's in me, but functions as an internal constraint on my will or inclination. So inclination is the thing he sees as being governed by the moral law or, or, or brought down by the moral law. And this is how he puts it. This is in uh, Second Critique, Critique of Practical Reason. He says, freedom, the causality of which is determinable only through the law, consists just in this, that it restricts all inclinations and consequently the esteem of the person himself to the condition of compliance with its pure law. So this idea of freedom associated with this fundamental restriction, which gets developed throughout German idealism, Hegel also as well. Uh, although the law restricts, the restriction frees the subject from its dependence on the illusion of self-interest or the compulsion of external determinants. 
But because Kant has no theory of the unconscious, he cannot grasp the full radicality of his own insight. So as I think is an interesting thing that, that Kant comes up on this thing that, that if he had an idea of the unconscious, I think it would have pushed him a little bit further. I think the same is true of Hegel, by the way. Uh, although Hegel, oh God, he almost anticipates psychoanalysis in so many ways. Uh, so Kant identifies the moral law with freedom, but he ultimately aligns uh, uh, free adherence to the moral law with the subject's own good. And this is where I think Kant cheats, actually, and reintroduces the good. So the defiance of, the, of one's own good actually leads back in the last instance to a more worthy good and when God, re this, he really thought this, God rewards the subject for its moral choices. So this is, you see, so Kant thinks you can't just have this destroying, this, this rejection of the good by the moral law. In the end, obeying the moral law has to pay off in some way with a better, a more complete good, which is uh, uh, immortality reward by God. So, but I think in this way, we can see Kant's inability to theorize the unconscious, or maybe to put it in a different way, his inability to accept the full reality of what Freud might call, someone mentioned yesterday, common human unhappiness, this like satisfaction in unhappiness, something like that that this causes Kant to retreat from freedom back to self-interest at the very end. So Kant gives ground relative to liberalism. Lacan says don't give ground relative to your desire. I think you should say don't give ground relative to liberalism. But um, So Kant gives ground relative to liberalism when he imagines happiness or the good as a reward for the free choices of the moral subject. So I think it would require Freud to add the next, and that's what I'm going to try to do, crucial turn of the screw to Kant's formulation of the relationship between the subject and its own good. With his discovery of the death drive in 1920, this was talked about yesterday, and I think this is the great moment in Freud. So 1920, Eureka. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I mean, obviously he's great before that, but that was the big time. Uh, Freud conceives of a subject that finds satisfaction in its own failures rather than in its successes. But Freud, I think, and this is why I said before that, it's still pretty good. Uh, Freud hints at this well before 1920, this concept of satisfaction in, lib in, lib in the libidinal economy, this conception of satisfaction through failure in the libidinal economy is actually present as early as studies on hysteria in, in 1895 and in Freud's initial theory of the unconscious. So from the moment he theorizes it, I think, the unconscious, like the Kantian moral law, and I think those two are nicely linked in a cool way, uh, undermines the subject's good in order to provide satisfaction to the subject. So although he has no intention of building on Kant's legacy, far from it, Freud, uh, I think, slanderously linked Kant with the superego, which I, I'm like, every time I read that, I'm like, I, I can't believe I still like Freud, but okay, I still do. Um, so Freud does precisely this, that is build on Kant's legacy, when he conceives of the unconscious as a foundational psychic agency, especially as he theorizes it in these later years after the discovery of death drive. The unconscious acts against the subject's good. I think that's absolutely of primary importance. It satisfies itself through the subversion of the subject's conscious self-interest. It attains satisfaction that transcends all mean egoism. Although it is not solely an ethical agency, obviously unconscious can lead us to do unethical things, right? Uh, the unconscious never leaves the subject free to act purely in its own self-interest. That's when we're governed by the unconscious, we're, that's not being governed by self-interest, I want to claim. Its grounding principle is the satisfaction that derives from undermining the subject's own good. Whenever the unconscious manifests itself, it spells trouble for the social prospects of the subject. Hopefully everybody's had a moment when your unconscious has manifested itself and it's spelled trouble for your social projects, so you can understand what I'm saying. On the most basic level, this is so basic, sorry, and so obvious, I apologize. An unconscious slip can reveal a desire at odds with what one consciously hopes to accomplish. Say I try to advance my interest in my, my, my interest in, by complimenting my job, hoping to get a, my, sorry, my job, compliment, I already made a slip. Uh, complimenting my boss, hoping to get a promotion, right? Okay, so I say, I, I mean to say, I really liked your presentation in the meeting, 
But instead I say, I really liked your ejaculation in the meeting. Right? Okay, so I thought, that was the first example that came to my mind, and I thought, no, it's inappropriate. But then I thought, well, it sh I should say something inappropriate because that makes my whole point, and now I've undermined your, all your interest in my, what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, anyway, so rather than obtaining the promotion I hope for, I'll either be sent to sexual harassment training or I'll be fired, right? Or maybe I'll be like, he'll be like, okay, go back to a cubicle. You're never getting anything. Okay. Uh, the slip has the effect of subverting what I wish will happen. Okay, so that, to me, so slip is, the, I think, the ground level of this. But it is the slip, the manifestation of the unconscious, not what I consciously wish for, that expresses my freedom. While the slip undermines my prospects for employment, it simultaneously asserts the distance that separates me from the social imperatives that swirl around me. So by engaging in the slip, I affirm the singularity of my subjectivity, even though it's horrific, it's horrific. I wish I didn't do it. Not every expression of unconscious freedom leaves me unemployed, obviously, hopefully. hopefully. Uh, but freedom does always have the effect of damaging me, damaging me in some way. The free act doesn't give the subject something additional, but takes something away. I think this is the crucial thing, that freedom always takes something from us. It doesn't give us. So that's why the freedom to consume is never freedom, right? It's good. Something has to be taken away. Uh, it occurs at odds with the subject's good, which puts the, puts the subject, I'm sorry, which the subject puts up as a barrier to its freedom. Libidinal economy, in other words, works against self-interest. It produces the satisfaction that sustains the subject through a continual sacrifice of the subject's own good. In the psychic economy, this is the only function that the good can have. I really think this. I don't pursue it, I sacrifice it in order to satisfy myself. And I know this seminar is scandalous or, or doesn't really fit in, but this is, I think, one of the nice points that Jacques Lacan makes in his seminar on the ethics of psychoanalysis. Uh, he states, and this, I think, this holds other things may not hold from that seminar. Uh, he states, there is no other good than that which may pay the price for access to desire. So his point is, good only, that's the only function it has. We sacrifice it. The only purpose of the good is to, as this, to function as this tool of sacrificing for the sake of our libidinal economy. The satisfaction that we get frees us from our dependence on the lure of the good by exposing its nullity. It is only by sacrificing it, the good, that we can realize its illusory status that compels us for so long, that compels us, sorry, so long as we pursue it. So freedom is identical with the subject's satisfaction. This is, I think, an interesting, for me, an interesting idea. That when the unconscious manifests itself against self-interest, it asserts the subject's freedom. This assertion satisfies the subject by recapitulating the loss that found subjectivity. The subject emerges through a loss that gives it something to desire. So it's, of course, it hasn't lost anything, but it's the act of losing that inaugurates subjectivity. Without this loss, I think, subject isn't subject. Subject is nothing at all, which is why it can find satisfaction only through the repetition of lost and never by attaining an object. So I think this is crucial to the way the psychic economy functions. So through failure, the subject actualizes the structuring loss that defines it. The problem is that the structure of consciousness, I think, is absolutely opposed to the subject's form of satisfaction. No one can consciously pursue failure without transforming it, the failure into a good. If you know this, I, this, I apologize, this is probably an American reference, but if you know sports teams that want to lose to gain a, a future draft pick, this is kind of, it's called tanking. It's exactly this, uh, so they, they turn losing into the goal and the fans like, the team loses, the fans stand up and clap, they're so happy they've lost. But of course, they've just made it into another way of winning, they made losing into another way of winning. Okay, that, to me, that's the most obvious example, but I'm sorry, it's very uh, parochial. Uh, okay, uh, where's that thing? Okay, so, so we can never consciously take up our unconscious freedom. That's the idea. That, that the unconscious freely acts freely prior to the intrusion of consciousness, which is always kind of lagging behind, and so conscious will is never free in the way the unconscious is. But if we're unconsciously free, this means that freedom is also radically opposed to free will. So whenever anybody says to me, do you believe in free will? I say, no, but I believe in freedom. So I think, that, I think those two things are opposed. 
So freedom appears not through a mental operation, but in our actions that express the unconscious. We don't consciously guide these actions. Instead, we experience our unconscious acts as compulsions. We experience our freedom only in the form of a compulsion. This is, I think, one of the great paradoxes, that it's the moment where we feel compelled that th those are the assertions of our, of our freedom. When acting unconsciously, we act against our conscious will, but it's through the unconscious that I assert my freedom, both from external constraint and from the constraint of my own self-interest, which I was arguing are the same. Uh, okay, so the most that consciousness can do in the face of our unconscious freedom is to acknowledge its priority and identify the unconscious act as an expression of the subject's desire. It must try to, consciousness is always trying to catch up with a freedom that remains ahead of it at all times. Most of the time, we disavow our free acts as missteps that we endeavor to correct through subsequent repair efforts. I didn't mean that, I didn't mean to do that, et cetera. Uh, but the misstep is the fundamental form of freedom because freedom is located in the unconscious rather than conscious control. The only part of the of conscious, the only part that consciousness has to play in freedom, I think, is the acceptance of our unconscious acts as the manifestation of freedom. Insofar as everyone has an unconscious, everyone is free, but the psychic and political lesson of psychoanalysis, I think, is that one must reconcile oneself to one's freedom. My free act occurs before I have consciousness of it. My free acts appear as aberrations that threaten to detour my secure existence, but I must look at these threats as the form that my freedom takes and reconcile myself to that disruptiveness. The unconscious leads the way for the subject, but only by exploding the illusion of the good that guides conscious activity. Of course, Okay, I know someone would say this, so I'll, this is the first question posed to me by me. Um, but hey, not every eruption of the unconscious affirms the subject's break from social determinants. There are moments when the unconscious aligns with our society's superegoic injunction for sure, right? Okay, here's my answer. At such moments, following the unconscious is a form of obedience to the social order, a mode of conformity. Yes, the unconscious is also the site of superegoic compulsions that use the subject's self-destructiveness as a d disciplining mechanism. Happens all the time. When the unconscious expresses the superego, it seems to function like a site of unfreedom rather than one of freedom. Okay, so my entire paper is shot. Wait a minute, okay, I have a, <laughs> I have a response. But I think even our adherence to the superego unconsciously marks a moment of freedom. When we unconsciously follow the superego's imperatives, we do obey the social demand through these actions. They nonetheless assert our freedom because they can, they always effectively undermine our good as much as when we follow our desire. So even when we're following the super egoic unconscious demand, it, we're still engaging in this self undermining. So even though the super ego is an agent of, of conformity and ethical turpitude, it is nonetheless a site slightly of freedom when it manifests itself unconsciously, which of course is the way the superego manifests itself. So following the dictates of the superego represents what I would call a free capitulation. I know that sounds uh, Orwellian, sorry. Uh, it's linked to the unconscious is the link to freedom. So there is this problem, but I think it's still not a terrible, not a deadly problem. Uh, okay, so I'm almost done. Uh, when he conceives of the unconscious, Freud does not believe he's developing a theory of freedom. Uh -huh. He doesn't. To the contrary, he contends that a strict necessity governs our libidinal economy. He always thinks this. He thinks I'm not an apostle of freedom. He calculates how the psyche functions on the basis of the necessity that govern it, governs it, which is one reason why he believes that one day we might, he has famously says this, we might discover the physiological explanations that could replace our psychoanalytic ones. I wish he didn't say that, but uh, but Freud never took stock of how the logic of the unconscious shatters the image of the good for every subject. Once we understand how the unconscious satisfies itself through the destruction of our good, which Freud begins to theorize in Beyond the Pleasure Principle in 1920, discovering its association with freedom becomes the next logical step. Freud couldn't take this step himself because the only conception of freedom he had available to him was the liberal one because he didn't read Kant in the right way and he didn't read Hegel at all. Uh, so Freud could not, uh, sorry, uh, Freud was not a careful, I just said this, Freud is not a careful reader of Kant, 
And he mentions Hegel twice only, and both times clear that he didn't, didn't read it. And if you look at his library, there's no volumes, thank God, there's no volumes of Hegel in it. So it's, 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 it's evident that he didn't. So the result is that he couldn't identify the subject's annihilation of his own, its own good with the ultimate assertion of the subject freedom. Freud just couldn't, he didn't have the conceptual tools for that. So no social order, I don't think, can privilege genuine freedom for its adherents. To do so would strip away their attachment to the order and pave the way for a constant threat to the order's overthrow. Like if, we really, if some social order really made people free and, and, and privilege that, then there'd be this constant danger that the social order couldn't stomach. The liberal capitalist order seems to fly in the face of this because it thrives on freedom and actually couldn't function without some form of free market that enables producers and consumers to choose the commodities they'll produce and consume. The paradoxical conclusion is that capitalism lives, relies on freedom, but that freedom embodies the annihilation of any, every ruling social link. So that's the paradox, that's the problem. The solution to this riddle lies in an exploration of the nature of freedom. Freedom that would break from the ruling order is distinct from the freedom of choice that sustains the capitalist system. In fact, capitalist freedom of choice depends on an abandonment of what I think is genuine unconscious freedom, uh, which is the only basis for any possible political rupture. The oxymoron of unconscious freedom, I think, serves as an engine for a political break insofar as it, it involves a refusal of the givens that determine our situation. Unconscious freedom is the expression of a libidinal economy that run, runs counter to political economy. A freedom of desire rather than of conscious will. This sort of freedom cannot be directly conscious and can only become so after the fact. One can identify unconscious freedom only in the form of the event that compels one to act. The liberal conception of freedom has dominated thinking for so long because it works hand in hand with the illusion of the good. It also aligns with our common sense, I think. It seems logical that we're free at the moment we make a conscious decision to pursue an end that we deem good. Preserving this image of freedom has the effect of preserving the good as an obtainable and worthy pursuit. When we look closer at the good, however, it loses its ability to be appealing. On closer examination, the good ceases to be anything at all. Deprived of the good, liberal freedom evaporates as well. Freud's discovery of the unconscious points to a radically different conception of freedom that holds up in the wake of the good. Unconscious freedom not only survives the death of the good, but thrives via its sacrifice. Thank you so much for listening.